speaker, uh, Father David Mark Neuhaus. Reverend Dave, Dr. David Mark Neuhaus, SJ, is a member of the Society of Jesus, Near East Province, and teaches scripture at the seminary of the Latin Patriarchate of Jerusalem in Beit Jalla, in the Religious Studies Department at Bethlehem University, and at the Silesian Theological Institute in Jerusalem. He completed a BA, MA, and PhD political science at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He then completed pontifical degrees in theology, theology and scripture in Paris, Centre Sèvres, and Rome, Pontifical Biblical Institute. His publications include Justice and the Intifada, Palestinians and Israelis Speak Out, edited with Kathy Bergen and Gassan Roubaix, New York, French Press 1991, in collaboration with Alain Marcadour. The land that I will show you, Land, Bible, and History, has been published in French, English, Italian, and German, and Writing from the Holy Land has been published in French 2017 and in English also this year. He served from 2009 to 2017 as Latin Patriarchal Vicar for Hebrew-speaking Catholics in Israel, a part of the Latin Patriarchate of Jerusalem, and is coordinator of the Pastoral Among Migrants. Father Neuhaus, we are very pleased to have you here today, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So I too thank you for this invitation, although I'll probably be doing something a little different than what uh, Rabbi David did. Uh, the title I gave was A, A, One Among Many, Christian View of Jerusalem, the Catholic Church, and the Holy City. <coughs> Jerusalem is certainly more than a geographical location or a socio-political reality for Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Pope John Paul II devoted his 1984 apostolic letter, Redemptionis Anno, to Jerusalem, and in it he expressed the depth of the attachment to the city. I quote here at length. Christians honor her with a religious and intent concern because there the words of Christ so often resounded. There the great events of the re redemption were accomplished, the passion, death, and resurrection of the Lord. In the city of Jerusalem, the first Christian community sprang up and remained throughout the centuries a continual ecclesial presence despite difficulties. John Paul continues, Jews ardently love her and in every age venerate her memory, abundant as she is in many remains and monuments from the time of David who chose her as the capital and of Solomon who built the temple there. Therefore they turn their minds to her daily, one may say, and point to her as a sign of their nation. And he goes on, Muslims also call Jerusalem Al-Quds, holy, with a profound attachment that goes back to the origins of Islam and springs from the fact that they have there many special places of pilgrimage and for more than a thousand years have dwelt there, almost without interruption. The question of Jerusalem is certainly also a political question and yet the Holy See does not see herself primarily as a political reality. The church sees itself as outside temporal rivalries, maintaining neutrality, although reserving the right to exercise her moral and spiritual power. Furthermore, the church offers guidelines to Catholic faithful with regard to political involvement, summoning Christians to cooperate under the help of Christ, the author of peace, with all men in securing among themselves a peace based on justice and love, and in setting up the instruments of peace. In the past century, the Roman pontiffs have repeatedly expressed their concern for Jerusalem, safeguarding Christian interests, and promoting the city's vocation. The modalities foreseen for achieving this aim have shifted as political realities have changed and the concerns of the church have broadened in their scope. Two basic concerns for Jerusalem have remained constant, the protection of the Christian holy places and the well-being of Christians. In recent times, two other concerns have also been formulated, the promotion of justice and peace 
and the nurturing of interreligious dialogue. Over the per past century, three stages in the development of Catholic thinking with regard to Jerusalem can be concerned. First, the city as a corpus separatum, the city enjoying a special statute internationally guaranteed, that's the second, and finally, the city within a negotiated settlement between Israelis and Palestinians with the involvement of all interested parties and the international community. Shortly from 1917 to 1962, on December the 10th, 1917, the British conquered Jerusalem. A few weeks earlier, the British government in the Balfour Declaration had promised the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. Although Pope Benedict XV welcomed the return of Jerusalem to Christian hands, he expressed concern that the arrival of large numbers of Jews would endanger the Christian communities and even replace them. In his first address to the Cardinals, Benedict's successor, Pope Pius XI, echoed his predecessor that the rights of the Catholics in Jerusalem might be negatively affected by the change in the status of Jews, Muslims, Anglicans and Protestants. The Holy See, although not invited to be party to the League of Nations definition of the British mandate for Palestine, formulated its position and relied on the French to bring this position to the attention of decision makers. The Holy See's Secretary of State, Cardinal Pietro Gaspari, wrote to the Secretary General of the League of Nations that although the Holy See had no objection to the British receiving the mandate for Palestine, it had great reservations about the implied change in the status of Jews. Article 4 of the mandate foresaw the involvement of an appropriate Jewish agency in the establishment of the Jewish national home and in the evolution of the country. Gaspari, while stressing that the Holy See did not oppose that the Jews have equal civil rights in Palestine, stressed that it could not accept that the Jews be granted a privileged position in comparison with others. During the following three decades, the Church continued to insist on the protection of the holy places and the Christian communities. The most effective way to protect Jerusalem, according to the Holy See, was to guarantee the city international status. In these years, the idea of a corpus separatum, a separate body, became the basis for the Church's vision of Jerusalem, a safe home for Christians, accessible to all, and outside the realm of territorial conflict. The Holy See began to lobby for this idea, particularly in the League of Nations and later in the United Nations, avoiding taking position on Zionist or Palestinian nationalism, the Church insisted that the mandate not be used as a means for changing the character of the Holy City. The United Nations Partition Plan in 1947, 70 years ago yesterday, also proposed a corpus separatum for Jerusalem and Bethlehem under the jurisdiction of the United Nations. As violence escalated in Palestine, Pope Pius XII dedicated the month of May 1948 to prayer for Palestine that concord and peace might triumph, but to little avail. During and after the 1948 war, Pope Pius XII, clearly pained by the war, also expressed outrage about the desecration of churches and other Catholic institutions. He outlined the idea that Jerusalem be guaranteed a status that would put it outside of the ongoing conflict between the newly established State of Israel and its Arab neighbors. His encyclical, published in October 1948, was devoted entirely to the question of the war. At the end of this encyclical, the Pope insisted that it would be opportune to give Jerusalem and its outskirts, where are found so many and such precious memories of the life and death of the Saviour, an international character, which in the present circumstances seems to offer a better guarantee for the protection of the sanctuaries. The idea of a corpus separatum for Jerusalem was taken up by the United Nations in Resolution 303 in December 1949, but both Israel and Jordan refused the idea, 
both having annexed parts of divided Jerusalem into the areas under their full jurisdiction. From 1962 to 1992, the convocation of the Second Vatican Council in 1962 by Pope John XXIII was to be a turning point in the history of the Church. With regard to the Church's position on Jerusalem, the promotion of ecumenical relations with Orthodox and Protestants, the budding dialogue with both Jews and Muslims, and the call to dialogue with the modern world would impact how the Church formulated her position. At the end of the second session of the Second Vatican Council, Pope John XXIII's successor, Pope Paul VI, announced that he would visit the Holy Land, a first overseas visit for a pope in centuries. This voyage was understood as a return to the roots of the Church. Without explicitly mentioning Israel or Jordan by name, Pope Paul explained that this pilgrimage, motivated by piety, would also be imploring divine mercy in favor of peace among men. The most important encounter in Jerusalem was not with political authorities, with Jews or Muslims, Israelis or Arabs, but with the Greek Orthodox patriarchs of Constantinople and Jerusalem, an enduring symbol of the desire for Christian unity. Three years later, on the outbreak of the 1967 war, Pope Paul repeated this wish. It is a supreme interest for all the descendants of the spiritual seed of Abraham, Jews, Muslims and Christians, that Jerusalem be de declared an open city, free from military operations, immune from causes of war, which have already caused such damage. He added that Jerusalem should be spared the regime of war and remain the holy city, a refuge for the helpless and wounded, a symbol for all of hope and peace. The new situation created after the war was seen as a yet another blow to attempts to leave Jerusalem outside of the conflict. After the 1967 war and the conquest of East Jerusalem by the Israelis, a subtle change in the formulation of the position of the Holy See becomes perceptible. No longer insisting on corpus separatum, that is the internationalization of Jerusalem, the Holy See began to promote a special statute for the holy places and the religious communities, which would shield them from the ongoing conflict. At the end of 1967, Pope Paul detailed the Holy See's vision regarding the necessity for an international regime that would ensure, and I quote, the liberty of cult, respect, conservation, and access to the holy places. Taking into account, and again I quote, the historical and religious physiognomy of Jerusalem. The special regime for the holy places was coupled with a concern for the welfare of the Christian communities that lived in the city. The Pope insisted on the free enjoyment of the legitimate civil and religious rights of persons, residences, and activities of all communities. Other subtle changes can be noted in Catholic discourse about Jerusalem after the Second Vatican Council. The Holy See was no longer uniquely concerned with Christian holy places and Christian communities, but also with questions of justice and peace and dialogue with Jews and Muslims. In a response to the Cardinals in 1973, the Pope stressed, I quote, the duty more than the right which we are obliged to work on because any resolution touching the state of Jerusalem and the Holy Land responds to the needs of the particular character of that unique city in the world and to the rights and legitimate aspirations of those who belong to the three monotheistic religions who have in the Holy Land sanctuaries among the most precious and dear to their hearts. The pontificate of Pope Paul VI saw an increasing acceptance of the reality of the state of Israel he received many of Israel's political leadership, even if there were still no di diplomatic relations with Israel, and parallel to that, a recognition that the Palestinians were a people with the right to a homeland in Palestine. The Palestinians were no longer referred to as refugees, but as a people. Pope Paul's successor, Pope John Paul II, promoted the new vision of relations with Jews and with Muslims, a fraternal dialogue that had, 
definite implications for the position on Jerusalem. However, the Holy See continued to insist on a special status for Jerusalem, and it was this message that Pope John Paul II brought to the United Nations in 1979. In that same year, the permanent observer of the Holy See at the United Nations made a detailed declaration on Jerusalem, and therein he stated, I quote, On this subject, the Holy See endeavors to keep in contact not only with the religious authorities of the various Christian churches, but also with the principal leaders of Islam and Judaism. He went on to say that whatever solution be found to the question of sovereignty over Jerusalem, the satisfying and safeguarding of requirements must be ensured, and at the same time the international community ought to be guarantor of interests that involve numerous and diverse peoples. In the Declaration, the Holy See insisted upon a solution that would ensure justice attained by peaceful means. According to the Holy See, the special statute, statute internationally guaranteed for Jerusalem had to include the parity of all the religious communities, access to the holy places, and equal enjoyment of rights for all religious communities. In 1984, with his apostolic letter dedicated to the subject of Jerusalem, John Paul evoked Pope Paul's 1964 pilgrimage and expressed his own desire to go there. He wrote, Indeed, there should be found with goodwill and far-sightedness a concrete and just solution by which different interests and aspirations can be provided for in a harmonious and stable form. Underlining the demand that Isra Israelis might live in security and that Palestinians might be accorded a homeland, he continued, I am convinced that the failure to find an adequate solution to the question of Jerusalem and the resigned postponement of the problem only compromises further the longed-for peaceful and just settlement of the crisis of the whole Middle East from 1992 to today. Further subtle change in the nature of the discussion was due to the initiation of negotiations between the Holy See and both Israel and the Palestine Liberation Organization after 1992, undertaken in the light of the beginning of negotiations between Israeli and Palestinian leadership. While maintaining that the Holy See's position on Jerusalem had not changed, a new element had become apparent in the Holy See's discourse encouraging direct negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians and accepting that these negotiations would ultimately decide the fate of Jerusalem, all the while insisting on international guarantees for the safety and well-being of both the holy places and the communities that worship there. The signing of the fundamental agreement between the Holy See and the State of Israel in 1993 raised much controversy regarding possible imminent changes in the Holy See's position on Jerusalem. Although the agreement made no specific mention of Jerusalem, the Church repeatedly insisted that no, position, no change in position had been made. The Holy See's position was summarized as follows. I quote, The part of the city militarily occupied in 1967 and subsequently annexed and declared the capital of the State of Israel is occupied territory, and all Israeli measures which exceed the power of a belligerent occupant under international law are therefore null and void. The Declaration also acknowledged that the Holy See's interest in Jerusalem went way beyond territorial issues and touched upon a religious dimension. Safeguarding the identity of Jerusalem means that the historical and material characteristics of the city as well as its religious and cultural char characteristics must be preserved. The Declaration also made clear that this should not only be understood as applying to the holy sites, but also to the communities that live around the sites. In November 1997, the Legal Personality Agreement between Israel and the Holy See was signed in order to facilitate the recognition of the Catholic Church's institutional life in the State of Israel. Although again Jerusalem was not mentioned in the agreement, controversy was stirred 
because the list of institutions attached to the document included those in East Jerusalem, territory occupied after the 67 war. On this issue, the Holy See continued to insist that it strictly abided by international law, making a distinction between the part of Jerusalem that was part of the State of Israel and the part of Jerusalem, including the Old City, that was occupied by Israel in 1967. In the agreements with Israel, the Holy See recognized that Israel administered the territories that had been occupied, but did not consider them part of the State of Israel. The signing of the basic agreement between the Holy See and the Palestine Liberation Organization in February 2000 refocused attention on Jerusalem. The text of the agreement spoke of Jerusalem at length. I quote, declaring that an equitable solution for the issue of Jerusalem based on international resolutions is fundamental for a just and lasting peace in the Middle East and that unilateral decisions and actions altering the specific character and status of Jerusalem are morally and legally unacceptable, calling therefore for a statute, a special statute for Jerusalem, internationally guaranteed. Diplomatic relations established with both Israel and Palestine paved the way for three visits of a Pope to Jerusalem. During these visits, the Popes were able again to draw attention to Jerusalem's identity and vocation. For example, John Paul II at an interreligious gathering in Jerusalem in March 2000 said, I quote, for all of us, Jerusalem, as its, names, as its name indicates, is the city of peace. Perhaps no other place in the world communicates the sense of transcendence and divine election that we perceive in her stones and monuments and in the witness of the three religions living side by side within her walls. Pope Benedict, who visited Jerusalem in May 2009, said, and I quote, as a microcosm of our globalized world, this city, if it is to live up to its universal vocation, must be a place which teaches universality, respect for others, dialogue and mutual understanding, a place where prejudice, ignorance and the fear which fuels them are overcome by honesty, integrity and the pursuit of peace. In May 2014, Pope Francis became the fourth pope to visit Jerusalem in modern times. During his visit to the state president's residence, he said, I quote, I am happy to be able to meet you once again, this time in Jerusalem, the city which preserves the holy places dear to the three great religions which worship the God who called Abraham. The holy places are not monuments or museums for tourists, but places where communities of believers daily express their faith and culture and carry out their works of charity. Precisely for this reason, their sacred character must be perpetually maintained and protection given not only to the legacy of the past, but also to all those who visit these sites today and to those who will visit them in the future. Flying back to Rome, the Pope commented on the various proposals regarding a solution to the question of Jerusalem and formulated clearly that negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians must ultimately resolve the status of Jerusalem. He said, the Catholic Church has its own position from a religious perspective. It will be the city of peace of the three religions. The concrete measures for peace must emerge from negotiations. I believe that one has to enter into negotiations with honesty, a spirit of fraternity and mutual trust. And there everything is negotiated, all the territory, also the relations, Courage is needed for this. And I fervently pray to the Lord that these two leaders, these two governments, will have the courage to go forward. This is the only path to peace. I only say what the Church must say and has always said. Jerusalem should be preserved as the capital of the three great religions, as a point of reference, as a city of peace. And I conclude. The Holy See has already concluded a final agreement with the State of Palestine signed on June the 26th, 2015. 
This agreement calls for an equitable solution for the issue of Jerusalem based on international resolutions, stating that unilateral decisions and actions altering the specific character and status of Jerusalem are morally and legally unacceptable. It is expected that a final agreement will be signed with the State of Israel in the very near future, after 25 years of negotiations. Unfortunately, though, negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians have not yet brought about a lasting peace, and Jerusalem remains an arena of ongoing conflict. The Holy See, insisting on its neutrality with regard to territorial claims to the irritation of the Palestinians, and on its strict abiding by the definitions of international law and UN re resolutions to the irritation of the Israelis, sees its role as preserving a dimension of Jerusalem as holy city, where three rela religions converge and where Christianity has its origins, a dimension too often marginalized in the national conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. Undoubtedly, the Holy See will continue to work tirelessly to promote its vision and Jerus of Jerusalem as a city of peace and a place where Jews, Muslims and Christians can live together and bear witness to a God who loves all of these children called to make Jerusalem a place where God's name is venerated. Thank you.